Is there like a thing we say at the beginning? Because if no oh, one's yeah. taking mm-hmm. the lead. Yeah, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Geek Public. I'm uh, Eric Whalen. You know me probably, unless this became the first episode somehow. Who are you? Hi, I'm Sam Sterling. I'm Angelique Rockwood. And my name's Emmett Fury. We're all here on a panel about collaborating, but Ryan decided not to uh, be the moderator this time. So we're going to collaborate on collaborate on this panel about collaborating. So if you see us stumbling a lot, mm-hmm. it's all part of the process. It's intentional. Mm-hmm. It's an educational video, a workshop. <laughs> <laughs> you get to see our rough draft. Yeah. <laughs> what have you collaborated on before? I haven't. Well, in, or I have to the extent that uh, as, an, as an entertainment attorney, I'm collaborating and helping everyone get their projects together. Fantastic, Sam. Yeah. Um, I, I've done a lot of collaboration with people in the tabletop space. Um, a lot of times people coming together, putting on shows, uh, running games, all that kind of thing. And it's really cool when a bunch of people in the community can come together and make something really awesome. And Everybody's input makes it better than the last, and I, yeah, I love it. Here, here, absolutely. Uh, same with my experience. I have written. Uh, I've been part of a writers' room for ABC Studios, and I've written for games and for trivia shows and for uh, LARP. That was fun. Uh, so all different kinds of ways to collaborate with all different kinds of people and for different kinds of audiences. I've learned a lot. Uh, yeah, and I'm a narrative designer and an interactive storyteller. So most everything I've done has been. A collaboration with the audience in some way and of course the other creatives uh, i ran a a alternate reality game for wizards of the coast for dungeons and dragons in 2018 uh and uh, was on uh, the creative team for ingress at niantic for about three years and our last gig was on a upcoming uh branching narrative project called silent hill ascension mm. okay i'm just gonna pitch this to the group mm-hmm. what if we all figure out what to say and then t- tell him how to say it because his voice is just like made for this <laughs> i like, like his, his voice yeah i know that well, yeah, t- tell, us a, tell us a quick story of uh, the, the, your latest project i'll tell a story about so for the uh for the arg we did for wizards uh i worked with an incredible puzzle designer named elisa teague and i was sort of doing the narrative side of it playing the characters online and I had decided because I like to write an iambic pentameter in rhyming verse. So she would tell me what the clue had to say, and then I would write a poem. And then she'd be like, that's a beautiful poem, but it needs to convey this exact thing. And I'm like, don't feel bad. Like, uh, the main thing is that we convey this information. So, uh, you know, it was this iterative process of me writing a sonnet and then her giving me more input until we got a thing that conveyed the clues for the puzzle correctly. That's amazing. Oh, I'm curious listening to everyone. Since you've collaborated with more people than I have, how do you go about choosing who you're going to collaborate with so that you're not... Uh... They give you a paycheck. No. Okay. Oh, okay. I mean, yes, paycheck above all. But it's but it's like I would, th- I would think, having less experience at it, that it would be quite daunting to sort of choose someone that you think uh, would mesh with your own personal brand when sort of creating something in the greater public... Uh, Cosmos, like I appreciate people who listen and have a like, and also can have a bigger sense of a bigger uh, sight of what we're working on. Mm-hmm. So even if we get in the nitty gritty, we, they can still see the bigger project. Like, who is the audience? Does this matter? Mm-hmm. This part of it. Um, I have realized, especially in collaboration, because you're kind of putting everything out there, a something that turns me off of collaborating with something is when I'm constantly interrupted. I know it's a lot, it's just a different kind of communication style and I'm just not used to it because I'm from the South. But, but when I'm constantly interrupted, I do find myself not wanting to talk as much as normal or it put as much out as normal. Mm-hmm. So, but that's not saying you can't interrupt me. <laughs> I'm just saying in the collaboration because all the uh, ideas are just coming so fast. And you're like, I didn't actually, this, that was the preamble before my actual idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'll get my idea out next time. <laughs> yeah, I think that, like, that is the big thing for me is when I, I meet people and I spend time with people, knowing what kind of energy that kind of that person is going to bring to a project and how that energy will be utilized, whether they're collaborating in 
pre-production for something or if they're going to be um, like a player on your, your live stream and things like that. And so when I've worked with people, I, I kind of have a sense of like what this person is bringing to the table in sense of like their creativity and their personality. And you know, the more you, you get a sense of that energy, the more you can, you know, make sure they're in a place that really serves who they are as a person, which will make the whole project better for everybody. Yeah. Could, could you quickly elaborate on, um, you, you made a difference between collaborating some with someone during pre-production and during the production of it? Are you saying that there are certain situations where you would collaborate with some or consider collaborating with someone in pre-production, but like, would... Oh, yeah. yeah, actually, I, I think it, there are some situations where when I have a group of people together and I know in this situation with this group of people, I need to take a stronger leadership stance on mm -hmm. things because I know that you know, these people are the creative types and they have ideas and they, you know, if you bring them out, they will execute, but the planning is not their forte. So I, in that situation, I know, okay, when things need to move forward and planning needs to happen, I will step up more as a planner, an organizer, a, a producer of things versus in other environments with certain people. I'm like, I know they have very similar penchant for the producing and the organizing. And I know there are more of like a equal collaborator in the pre-production sense of scheduling, planning ahead, making checklists and things like that. So I, I think that if there is ever somebody who wants to take on that role, um, absolutely working with them to, you know, make sh you know, show them the way that things get done while still always moving things forward. But knowing the kind of people who they just want to perform in something and the organization is not their strong point. Um, mm. It making sure that you don't put things onto them that they are not going to want to do, or they're going to feel like too much pressure in the project, the better, you know, each individual person and where their strengths are, the smoother the overall project's going to go. Yeah. I'd say um, certainly looking for people who are collaborative, but also like, people who bring something to the table that I don't because I kind of romanticize the idea of a good writer's room where everybody brings something unique and the end result is better than the sum of its parts because mm -hmm. I'm not good at everything. And sometimes I respect other creators because they can do things that I can't. Uh, I love it when uh, my team can take my idea and make it even better. Yeah. Like it's, it's the best feeling in the world. It's like, this is what I'm thinking, but also I assembled you guys for, here for a reason, especially when I'm directing. If you come up with something better, let's go for it. Tell me what it yeah. is, and we'll we'll go for it. I also realized when you were talking, um, I I don't so much look for the different parts of a team or how I interact with different kinds of people. Is that when I'm in an environment, I try to keep it at a good level. So if their energy is down here or they're not as good at this, I will bring it up. Mm. Or if someone's up here and they're like out of control, and they I will bring them down. I just need it to be at that level, and I don't like to be the person to bring people down. Mm. Yeah. So I'd rather be, work with people where I get to be more enthusiastic. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought of that before until I was hearing you talk oh. about your experience. It's a really good point because I think it creates a sense of not just like egalitarianism in you know, the amount that each person's collaborating, but also making sure that people who are less prone to step forward with certain things feel like they're in a safe place to put in collaboration and bring those ideas that are different than you might have. So that's really cool. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah, I've definitely been in rooms where everyone felt safe to raise concerns and rooms where they didn't, you know, and it's, you know, I love it when there's someone who's sort of leading the room can like, hear everything that's brought up and acknowledge it and talk it through. And even if they make a decision that's counter to that, like try to get everybody to safe, you know, try to be like, Hey, I see what you're saying there. And we're doing this because X, Y, Z, but like, may I uh, ask you a question? This, I, I hope this doesn't get off, us off topic, but did you ever have it where the writer's room kind of turned into the, the cafeteria at school? Cause when I was at, at ABC, there was like one writer that everyone decided that they wanted to pick on and that that's what united the writer's room was picking on this one staff writer. It I was, don't it was think I had that exact experience. Okay. All right. I didn't know if that was like just from comedy or what. 
That's interesting. Yeah. I know in business school, we had a good exercise just sort of, you know, uh, promoted for corporate positions uh, where they would suggest, like, if you have an hour meeting of brainstorming, for the first half hour, it's the divergence of putting all the ideas out onto a whiteboard, and no one is allowed to say anything wrong with them. You're not allowed to cross them out. The second half hour starts, nothing can be written down but things have to be eliminated and write, written out. So your like idea that. would stay on the board at least until the half an hour mark. And if someone said, oh, that's a stupid idea, uh, there were we were told that in many places like Hershey's and other companies, they would just look at the person and go, you're right, it is a stupid idea, get out. You disrespect, you, you harshed the vibe or whatever the corporate speak for that is and just- I, I like that idea. That my the only thing i would think would be getting in the way is that so much of the creativity is from problem solving it's like mm -hmm. i like this idea and then someone can go off of that idea or like combine the two so mm -hmm. you still can yeah work with everything whereas like if you take an idea off like this won't work like oh but if you turn mm -hmm. that idea mesh it with that one it becomes mm -hmm. different, but you wouldn't be able to put anything new yeah. on the board at that point. And you would have cycles of convergence and divergence as mm -hmm. you had multiple meetings and just, but just making sure to respect everyone's contribution, similar to the improv uh, policy of just yes and. Which, yeah. 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 I think a lot of so-called bad ideas end up being the stems for good ideas and you would never have got there if somebody didn't say it the first time. So yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. That's why it feels good if you're in an environment that lets you say a thing that you know isn't right and you know isn't there yet, but that mm -hmm. the room can take it and turn it into something great. Yeah, Absolutely. making everyone feel safe to contribute. Really important there. Yeah. The question I'd want to ask but shouldn't be aired is, do you regret, are there any stories of times you've regretted uh, collaborating with someone uh, without getting too specific, but just sort of traits to avoid? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's... <laughs> I think that a lot of regret with collaboration can be avoided by putting forth really clear expectations for the extent of how much you, you want this person to put into it, right? Mm. If a person's expecting to just, you know, my examples are all like games, live play, and like things like that. If a person's expecting to just show up and perform, but you want them to have had like written out a backstory that you can pull from and you just drop that on them the day before things like that i feel like that's where situations go go bad i don't feel like i've really ever had experiences where you know someone was just a bad apple because because normally i you can get that sense ahead of time and mm -hmm. when you're picking people to collaborate with so I, having really clear expectations making sure that those are met on both ends, right? So if you invite someone to play, you know, on a show and then they get no, they, they never have a chance to talk or they kind of get passed over a lot, that's not meeting their expectations either and they're going to have a bad time. And that, meeting that balance on both ends with communication ahead of time, I feel like really prevents things like that from happening. My main regret, I'm thinking back, because I wasn't actually a writer in that writer's room, so I assume that writer would have had a bad time. Yeah. But for me personally, it's mostly been, it's been a great collaborative experience, but then the other person gets busy and then we mm. the project's mm. not finished. Like yeah. uh, I worked um, for the better part of a year with a, a writer producer on this great pilot and I love this pilot. It's like, it's a magical girl uh, animated series, but it's about the tarot decks, about oh. the arcana. Wow. And so like I did, all this deep dive research and all this kind of stuff. We got these great characters. The pilot was pretty much done, and then uh, he had some other movies to work on. It's just like, uh, but this this mm. looks this was a lot of fun, <laughs> and that was a lot of work. But other than that, um, I knock on knock on wood. I haven't <laughs> yeah, had a bad one yet. <laughs> mm. uh, I don't regret working with anybody. I would say, in the rare occasion where you end up in a bad situation, sometimes I just need to learn to be quiet just be like you know what this is a job and you know if if it's not going to be safe for me to raise some issues then we'll just do what we're told like mm -hmm. i i do remember my uh feelings getting hurt once though oh. uh 
the, and it was fine. It was, it was valid. Uh, it was like the, what the person told me was valid. I was uh, helping them with some plot points on a book, and uh, I was getting really excited. I'm like, and this and this, and then this and this and this, and I was uh, I, I was going on a roll, and then they said something to the point of like, well, like, but this is my thing. I was like, mm. oh. oh, yes, mm. yes. Right, sorry, I was. I well, wasn't trying to take mm, it over. But. That is not very collaborative, right? <laughs> no, but I mean, to, also... I but mean, but I, at a certain point, I guess, yeah. somebody has to be... Yeah. Yeah. It's overstepping, similar to what Sam sort of said. I hear sort of a resemblance to the, the expectations line was sort of... Yep. Yeah. I, it, it occurred to me as people were talking, uh, that is actually part of how I'm involved with collaborations, is that uh, one of the legal instruments you can get from your entertainment attorney is uh, called a joint partnership agreement or various other things which dictate the expectations that all the people collaborating together toward a product uh, or project uh, all just sort of how their business relationship is going to work and figures that all ahead of time so that when someone feels like they don't want to do it anymore, that isn't at the time when they start talking about how are we splitting the money? Uh, okay, I'm done with all y'all. I'm taking all the rights and I'm, mm. you know, I'm going to cut the baby in half because I hate your guts so much. You have it all protected ahead of time mm -hmm. with legal instruments. And is, it like, is that like a prenup? Or? You, I mean, a prenup is just a contract setting expectations. So, yes, it's that in is, the same uh, the same family of things. Creative yeah. prenup. Yeah. Contract yeah. lawyers. Yeah. They're useful sometimes. <laughs> 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 so that brings there up. I have something that I definitely want to talk about is I, I've i never personally experienced a situation, but I've seen it out there in the creative world, especially in realms where people are, it's not a job, you know, it's people aren't getting paid, there aren't usually contracts. Mm -hmm. It's more of like, you know, self projects, you know, like self-funded projects, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, when, if you are having a project and you want people to be involved in it, make sure that they're getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. there are times where sometimes people get really, really excited about their project and have really big ideas and they start bringing people in. And then if you, ha if you're brought in by somebody and then you see, you know, the expectations for you just kind of like raise and raise and raise and raise. And, you know, it, it seems like it's all about the person who's putting it on without really mm -hmm. like the respect or, or the care or the true collaboration of the idea that you're all creative people here to try to make something together and it becomes a one person show mm -hmm. and you're, you know, situations like that, you really, really want to avoid. And I think that being somebody who's going to start a collaborative project, it is your responsibility to ensure that you are not just using people's labor for your own means without having an equal exchange of whether it's whatever the benefit is, you know, if, if this is really something that other people are excited about, just don't take them for granted on that. They want to do this with you. They want to collaborate with you and just make sure everyone's being respected with their time and their, and just their creative energies and things like that. And there's a lot of ways you can do that without, you know, if it's a project that doesn't have lots of money involved, it's just more about the consideration on the front end of those things. Um, Cause I, I've heard things on the wind of, of, you know, friends of friends of friends getting involved of projects where it just goes bad mm -hmm. in that direction. So if you are leading a project, make sure that is the number one thing you're thinking about because take care of your friends, take care of your collaborators mm -hmm. and you will have future collaborators to work with you yeah. ongoing into the future, which it's is what you're gonna want. Really good point. You know, I think, right, bare minimum, I'm gonna make sure everybody involved donating their time feels creatively fulfilled and mm -hmm. sometimes if you're running it you're not thinking about the perspective of each other person and, and the decisions you're making but you're right it's mm -hmm. it's important to be able to think about that a great example of that i've seen personally and i'm i don't know this will just this will just be my experience i i'm not speaking for all but uh, i'm part uh, i'm part of the cast of a labyrinth masquerade ball and it's one of the largest masquerade balls in all of north america and it's pretty much all volunteers. Mm -hmm. We're all volunteers and we put a lot of hours in, but we still are being treated with respect and everyone has all this understanding of, it's a free event, like you are working for free. Uh, mm -hmm. You're technically getting in for free, mm -hmm. uh, but what we want to do is always looked at and we are always felt, 
at least in my personal experience, it always always feels like we are being appreciated and we can't we keep going back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Again, my own personal experience. Yeah. And that's really <laughs> good because if you are running a pro- like a long term project where it's part of your expected and anticipated business model to burn out and burn through mm-hmm. your collaborators, that's not a great project. I don't know. That's that. Uh, You're gonna run out of collaborators. You know that, that's <laughs> that. I don't know. That sounds. Yeah. yeah, even but. in Los Angeles, where we get a new, like, fresh stock every year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, taking advantage of that fresh stock to sort of hide uh, strange business practices People or collaborations. Talk. Yeah, exactly. People talk. Mm-hmm. Exactly. If respecting <laughs> your collaborators isn't enough of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just the joy of respecting people yeah. isn't enough for you, just think about the fact that it, it mm-hmm. will get around, you mm-hmm. know, if you become somebody who is not taking care of the people who are putting, giving you their labor, because that's what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and labor is time and money, even if they're not yeah. getting paid, they, they could be doing something else. They could be driving Uber. Mm-hmm. Also, of doing if you're project. collaborating with someone for free and they're late, you can say like, we, we would prefer if you're on time, but you should never yell at someone who is no. on set mm-hmm. for free because they're late. I, yeah, I haven't no. seen yeah. it, but I've heard of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't chain your volunteers to tables. That's important. That's, that's always important. Yep. That's, <laughs> yeah. Unless you specifically mm-hmm. request, <laughs> unless there's consent, is yes, override. Yeah. That was in my writer. Yes, yeah. I, I've got mm-hmm. a shackle on right now. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I chose this guy. That's fine. Okay. What's something that you guys really love to collaborate on? Like, what kind of uh, stories or like mediums? Oh, I have one. Yeah. Um, so aside from tabletop live streams and things like that, um, I've recently been. Uh, getting into interactive experiences. Uh, and this last spring, I did a, an immersive interactive experience that I collaborated with some friends on. And it was so cool because I had never done something where I had seen the immediate reaction of the public who were experiencing it. Um, aside from, you know, if you're, if you're on Twitch, you see people's comments and things like that. But this was so much more, you know, live. And the people that I was with, the collaborators, were had these roles that they were playing and they were engaging with people in, in kind of an improv way and seeing the way that people would interact with them and how, you know, my friends were stepping up their their game in playing these characters and moving stories forward. And that was really, really cool. Um, just to go bigger than I've ever done before. It was an event that we had to drive out to. We had to set, decorate and set up. And it was a lot of work. Um, and even at the end, at the very end of breaking down all of our things. We were in a location where there were really high winds and I'll always have the memory of us trying to, it was like 15 of us trying to fold this massive tarp and we needed every single one of those people to fold that tarp in those high winds. And my the way my brain was just like, this is what it's about. The collaboration, <laughs> the friendship, the strength. <laughs> And it was it was great. Yeah, are we'll you allowed do it to say what it was? Yes, that was Neotropolis. Um, mm. I, we put together a experience called Proto Express. We were a galactic FedEx that was run by a slug overlord, um, and yes. we had a little booth where we were showing people, you know, this is our, this is what we do, and we gave them an integration test, which was basically being converted to a cult. Mm. Uh, it, we, there was so much joy of seeing people do this little, you know, interactive thing, and people would come with their friends and one friend would do the interactive little thing and their friends would watch them kind of slowly like go into this mindset of like this cultish cultish mindset of like yeah oh yes i want to join uh-huh and their friend the look on the friends faces would just be like what is happening <laughs> and the part about that specifically that has to do with collaboration was we had all these ideas and this lore behind this camp and everyone was that was in the camp was free to make it their own. And one of our camp mates just built that integration experience on their own. And, you know, I didn't really know what it was going to be about. Didn't really have a lot of input in it. I was just like, I trust you. You're good at this. Just go. And it became like one of the most, like people would stop me the next day and be like, that's, I've been looking for something like that at these events. I've never experienced it before. And I was like, oh my God, it's just, because you never know what people can bring to the space if you just, create an environment for them to let loose their their creativity in the ways that only they can do. So it was fantastic. But be there next year. So come by. Heck yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah I mean, I can tell a story. This is a more of a 
sort of collaborating with the audience, but in my earliest, in the late aughts, uh, my earliest forays into sort of interactive storytelling, I did a lot of it on Twitter. It's a dumpster fire now, and I will not refer to it as X, but back then it was kind of a, a cool place to experiment. And uh, a lot of what it ended up being was I was involved in the local indie web series community here in LA. And so we would do these interactive pieces where we'd make the series, and then I would make Twitter accounts for the characters in the series and play them in between episodes. So it's a lot of me talking to myself as the characters, <laughs> but also to the fans. And there was one particular project, uh, it was called The New Adventures of Peter and Wendy. And I was, uh, it's just a modern update of Peter Pan. The, the creators said, uh, it's sort of like New Girl with fairies. So it's like <laughs> set in basically our world, but like magic exists and fairies and mermaids and stuff. And I was specifically hired on to be the transmedia producer, which meant just to run the sort of interactive mm -hmm. part. So they wrote this, the, the, the show and produced it. And I just did the interactive stuff in between. And I have so many amazing stories mm -hmm. from it, but uh, my favorite one, was uh, in this iteration, John Darling was OCD about a lot of things, including cleaning. And this other character, fan character named Saw Blue, uh, ostensibly a fairy, like a magical fairy, and did not, uh, I don't know who they are in real life, right? Because, but was tweeted at John, like, hey, John, uh, I want you to come over and help me clean my apartment. And my mind, this is all text to role play, so like, mm -hmm. I don't know who they are, where they are, but I'm like, sounds like something John would do. So he's like, sure. So I, one day I have, role-playing them him helping her clean the apartment and she starts hitting on john and being like we should get a go to a movie and have dinner and i was like okay like i don't know how old this person is. there's not it's not responsible for these characters yeah. to date mm -hmm. so i so i was like but you know what i know how to be awkward when at so i was like you know I'm, i had john be like i'm really busy with my job at the local paper that my dad runs but if you want to see a movie and like have dinner as friends we could do that so apparently I just yes ended myself into another scene. And but <laughs> at this point, the fans started to ship the characters. And this oh, is no. first became aware of the term. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the night of their undate where we were role-playing them going to dinner, they were, the other fans were like role-playing like they were putting on trench coats and hats and hiding in bushes and trying to encourage romantic things to occur. Oh my gosh. That, that weren't going to occur. Mm -hmm. And or, that's what they called it in retrospect was the undate. But mm -hmm. the, the capper to it that I love the most was in the second season, I didn't know this, it, apparently all along, like we were gonna learn the second season that John was gay and I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I wanna address this in some way. Mm -hmm. And I, but I'm like, I don't think it would be like a public Twitter scene. Mm -hmm. So I sent some direct messages of the character to the other character and said, hey, you know, listen, I, I, I consider you as a, a good friend and I wanted you to be aware that I was aware of your interests and I was figuring some stuff out at the time and it's literally not you, it's me. And I, I just wanted you know, you to know that. And it was just this private sort of one-on-one -on -one scene. And he was sort of like, also, you know, not quite ready to talk about it publicly yet. So I appreciate it if you kind of kept that on the down low. And, but I was giving this, uh -huh. you know, them the opportunity to do whatever they wanted with it. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, like it. What did they do with it? Uh, kept it quiet until after it was revealed in the show and then shared screenshots <laughs> out of character, oh. after, which I'm happy that they did because, yeah. you know, it, in a way it was like a reward for the people who engage the most. Yeah. And, yeah. and we wouldn't have had, what an interesting way to depict that whole situation and only happened because, I mean, these are just the rules of being a good role player, but like, mm. uh, you know, we, so many little stories we had about that with the people that we got to, you know, we gave them a platform to tell stories. That's mm -hmm. one of the things I love about, you know, there's nothing stopping you from using a social media platform to make a bunch of character accounts and tell a story, right? It's, it's a big democratized way to do things. Um, my, one of my favorite things is, uh, I don't have a specific story, but it's honestly just uh, problem solving It's literally someone comes to me with a project or I go to them with a project and they figure out how to punch that up. Usually I'm very good at structure, um, and themes and characters. Um, but as you can tell, I am not the best at the speaking of the dialogues. Mm. And so, so sometimes, uh, people come in and help me with the dialogue unless someone comes to me with a project where they're very good at the structure and they can't do the dialogue. And then suddenly I'm amazing at dialogue. <laughs> it's like any, it, I feel like it's just, just like activating different parts of my brain when I see different problems that I get to solve. I like that a lot. I feel like that's a really good question to specifically ask is what do you feel like you bring to the table? Like, mm -hmm. and, and I think how this can relate to people listening is 
if we talk about our specific strengths, you know, that might pique an interest of like, oh, what mm. could I have to mm -hmm. offer a group of people? Whereas people might not normally think I could be the one bringing folks together. Does anyone want to? One of the strengths I bring is, and one of my favorite parts of collaborating is listening to sort of someone's passion and idea that they have. And then in trying to understand it, repeating it back to them and sort of figuring out, but uh, rewording it and restructuring it and tailoring it down. So into ways that they may not have originally had or been able to organize it mm. and sort of giving it this crisp streamlined structure of, oh, it's, you know, the first editing pass. Uh, I know that for a lot of the Geek Public episodes, that was one of the things I contributed uh, through that process, as well as a lot of the topics, but here and there. How about you, Strengths? Yeah, um, one thing that I've been doing recently uh, that I, I realized is a strength is making people go farther with their mm -hmm. ideas. Um, a, a lot of times folks that are, any anybody out there, might not realize that they have bigger ideas and they just are shutting themselves down because they don't think they're possible. And as somebody who, you know, like I'm an organizer and also a problem solver. So I'm, I'm good at thinking of like, you want to do this? Well, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So recently in my current projects that I'm working on, I'm getting a lot of joy out of saying like, what would really excite you? But like, but, but really, if you had all the resources in the world, start crazy delusionally big <laughs> and tell me what would you love to do? And then pulling that out of somebody and being like, okay, how do we do this actually? Because there is a way and we can kind of, you know, reverse engineer how we can bring this into reality for people. And I, I love doing that for folks and I look forward to doing more of it. Yeah. So I, ha I have an answer and I, I want you to answer too, but I want to ask you a question mm -hmm. um, about that, where you get really enthusiastic about so someone's like, they don't want to, or they, they don't think you, this thing is possible. Have you ever run into the situation where you get really enthusiastic about it, um, and then not only do they not meet the enthusiasm, mm. but you're kind of shut down for it? There was a time mm. where, uh, like eight years ago, I was uh, part of a group of friends that wants to do a Morris dancing uh, troupe thing, mm. and I'm like, I have no idea what that is. But you guys want to do it? Let's do it. I did all the research. Uh, I looked at all that kind of stuff. I got really into it and really excited. I'm like, okay, all right. So when we, can we do this? And then they were like, you're getting kind of annoying always talking about this. I'm like, what oh. you guys want it? Oh. Oh. That's a bummer. Yeah, but have you ever gotten like that? And how do you not get discouraged by that? I feel like I have experienced that. I can't recall any specific incidents. But I think that these days in... In my in my later years, I have gotten a lot better at surround like when I pull people in to collaborate, knowing who is you know just wild enough to respond positively to going big and going bigger, and having that kind of openness and you know that balance of you know not dipping too far into pessimism as as a person to collaborate is something that I I look for in people. Um, looking for optimism and, and willingness to see how far we can go. Mm -hmm. um, and because there's only, you can open people's minds to what's possible, but you can, you can only do so much, I think, is, is part of it. And mm -hmm. I think as somebody who's, if you're starting a project, knowing when a person is not there and they're not willing or ready to go big, and, and maybe their contribution, they can still contribute, and it's just all right, a little smaller, you know, for, for them particularly. Um, but when you find the people who are ready to do it yeah. and really be in, that's when the magic can really happen. So I think I look for those folks. Yeah. Yes, and I, yes, 100%. And also on the other side of that, I'm also wary of the people who are ready to go super big and they expect and feel entitled to immediate success. They're like, well, we're gonna do this, and then once we get more money and we get to do this, and it's like we might not get. Let's let's look at let's look at this one first bridge, cross that one, and then we can look at you know that sponsorship 
from this big company that doesn't know that we exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, the realism of what is possible is an incredibly important thing mm -hmm. to have on your team. And if you are the kind of person who is only like going big, going big, the collaborator that you want is the person who's looking at numbers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're not that person, get somebody on your team who can talk you down of like, you know, we got to stay a little bit more in budget than that because mm -hmm. the realism is an important aspect to bring to the party. Yeah. Absolutely. What was the original question? I'm so sorry. What strength do you bring to oh, collaborations? Yeah. Uh, apparently not listening or uh, retaining information. Uh, <laughs> honestly, uh, flexibility, problem solving, what you guys were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's actually probably one of some of most of uh -huh. really good collaborators' strengths yeah. is just organizing. You're pretty good at sticking with things. Do you, do you <laughs> want to just quickly say the end of that Morris da <laughs> dancing yeah. story? Wow, eight years ago getting eight shut ago. down. Yeah. But that's a real shame because Morris dancing is a really cool hobby. And I wish there were more in Southern California. So whatever happened to that doomed group? So then there came uh, a fellow from the Renaissance Fair that I participate in mm -hmm. who, is all, who did Morris dancing in Dublin, Ireland. And he said, well, I, I would love to have a Morris dancing troupe here. Would you like to uh, start one with me? I'm like, I have what I have. I have all this information. I have this little Facebook group and uh, with all the files and stuff like, yeah, let, let's do it. And now since I'm in that collaboration mode with him, I have given up. I don't have that defeatist mm -hmm. outlook on it now because it's not just for me. Like when I'm harassing everyone to try to come to practices, mm -hmm. uh, Eric, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not just like I don't feel like I'm hassling them for me because I can't do that for me, but I can uh, do that for him. Yeah, and it is my fault for missing practices. It is not like How Angelique. How dare you have a life? <laughs> Look, Angelique literally has bells and whistles for everyone. So plenty of perks going to it. Consider. We'll plug that later. Uh, <laughs> Emmett, what, what are your strikes that you bring to... Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I bring to the table or that I like to do, I feel like I'm good at, is like um, structuring a story from beginning to end from the audience's perspective, like doling mm -hmm. out story and across time and platforms when necessary, you know, before the uh, before the pandemic. This was just for fun. I was running like a 26 player tabletop game that was set on a space station, like no set parties, just people showing up. And I had a Discord server and was encouraging them to run tech scenes. And I, because of my old Twitter storytelling days, I like loaded 40 NPC accounts into there that I could just deploy when necessary. And you know, when you get to a number where, like in a tabletop role-playing scenario where not everyone is on every mission, uh, I love the ability to just give these people this information and these people this information. And, and the setup was very much like, this is a dangerous place where you shouldn't trust anyone. So because I was privy to all the in-character role-play scenes, I, it was like a big ensemble cast TV show that only I got to see all of. And watching mm -hmm. the players like break down their trust barriers, share information with each other, and then solve big mysteries of the story ways that weren't kind of spook fed to them, but they had to sort of collaborate to put them together. Uh, I really like that kind of storytelling, telling on a scale like that. It sounds like it requires a lot of strength of pacing and sort of making sure all of that. I was land. surprised. I, uh, I, I, I said that that show was like lost in space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and because it was Space all about polar bears. mysteries and secrets and I was afraid I was going to blow my water early because I'm like I want to get to the answers mm. to this mystery oh. uh, but I, I think that was the thing I liked most like there was barely any combat in the game it was like <laughs> hours of them talking and all I tried to do every mission was like what's the cool lore they're going to get that's going to make sense but not be the ending like it's like this is going to once they figure it out what's going on they're going to be like oh this makes perfect sense and then they're going to have that moment of and watching those was what was the best. Well, I think we talked about the leadership side of things. Like, what do you bring there? Um, if you had a tip, one tip for people who were brought to a project as collaborators, like you, you know, someone else initiated and you're participating, what would be a tip that you'd give somebody? Let others be wrong. Don't, Ooh. don't, don't keep your heels or don't, uh, yes, mm -hmm. uh, dig your heels in too much. Mm -hmm. Um, understand that your ideas might not be listened to or that might not be what goes forward. And they might realize you were right three months from now. And that mm -hmm. could have saved them a lot of time, but don't take it too personally and don't get too upset when they don't run with your idea. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say like not every idea you have is the right one. So mm-hmm. don't mm-hmm. you don't always have to fight for it. The goal, hopefully, is to make the best product we can, and uh, sometimes that means being collaborative and realizing when hey, you know what, mm-hmm. yours is better. Yeah, yeah, and and I've realized uh, later on sometimes when I got, I I still struggle with uh, in my mind letting people be wrong, but it was that I misunderstood what they were telling me. Mm. In, in fairness, they could have been more clear about what their idea was. And I'm like, wait, that doesn't make any sense and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, no, no, no we're going with it. So I'm like, okay. And then later on, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that was way better than my idea. Mm. Wasn't that how that was described? But that was way better than my idea. Mm. <laughs> so. yeah, I would say uh, don't over-invest if you are s- in the project if you are still very expendable. Uh, mm. I think that's sort of a feeling of if you, oh, I'm going to give this project all of my best ideas. Oh, no, I'm gone in season two. Uh, mm. That that leaves, like, sure, you may get paid, but that you're going to wear those scars. Like, mm. I think that's uh, over the years when I hear about collaborators, that's sort of the source of a lot of, a lot of the, the trauma even that'll get in the way of their future writing if they've over-invested themselves into something that doesn't necessarily uh, care about whether they're still attached. Yeah, I, I think there's a big balance to strike when you're coming on to a project mm-hmm. in not giving too much beyond the parameters mm-hmm. of you know what the environment's gonna be, but also making sure you're bringing your, your best self in a balanced way to what's been asked of you and, and the expectations that you have on you. Um, and in addition to that, the third thing I would say is if it's something where it's an opportunity that a lot of people deal with the imposter syndrome of, oh, I've been asked to do this thing and like, I don't know if I'm good enough and you're really nervous about this project, bringing confidence is a skill. And that is something really valuable to bring to the table. And I think if someone's asked you to be a part of something, they already value what you have to bring. So if that's something that you're particularly struggling struggling with in a project, I, I think that it will serve the whole project well if you remember that you're there for a reason and bring that confidence and be your best self within those parameters. And overall, everyone will have a, a wonderful experience and mm-hmm. you know, specifically mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. I could add to that real quick. I think, yeah, it, I just tell people, literally every creator has imposter syndrome always, no matter how mm-hmm. famous or successful you are. So that's not abnormal. Just like, you know. <laughs> I'm honestly a little suspicious of people who are never down on themselves or never seem to have imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. That makes me think that they might be a swindler. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to be completely mm-hmm. honest. Fair. And I've been, yeah. at least from from what I have seen so far, mm-hmm. right all eight times. Mm-hmm. Like, eight. Oh, yeah. Eight times. Oh, I've, I been, I've, been here, I've been here for 11 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the people I've seen who are able to successfully conquer imposter syndrome, it's usually they have a, that much experience. They yeah. have, mm-hmm. They've really gotten to the point where it's like, oh, I've been through this dog and pony show so many times that I know what I'm doing. It's almost tedious at this point. But yeah, I, yeah. I've gotten better at pretending I'm, I'm not worried about it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> which, I, which is different than there's difference between having confidence or lacking self criticism and being a braggart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think that's why I say confidence is a skill. Oh, you, yeah. you can learn it, you can train it, you can practice it. Mm-hmm. And this it being a skill doesn't mean that you don't feel, you can feel not confident on the inside, but you can still work through it and practice and, and come and bring your best in spite of that. Mm-hmm. It's like the whole idea of, courage being not like i don't have fear but i'm gonna do the thing anyway even if i'm scared so yeah and oh, oh uh, so yeah it's what you're saying it's very it's important to just not be paralyzed by it mm-hmm. and um you know i feel like and you can tell me if this is true for all everybody here but like i've found that like there have been things i've worked on that i was there obviously i don't know how we did it like i i you know like i can't believe we got it done and sometimes it's just like you're there in the trenches and you're doing it every day and you just well, we gotta get through this day we gotta do whatever we need to do today and eventually it's done but like have you had experiences like that too where you're like i can't believe we pulled off this project yes yes, yes. yes. yeah oh yeah anything i did in florida yeah. so, <laughs> it's like how did we not die how did we get that before uh taillights no 
we got that impossible shot. Real quick, a uh, thought that I had that while you two were talking mm -hmm. about skills and about not giving yourself too much, I thought of a metaphor of when you join a project where it's not your own project that you're bringing collaborators on, someone's bringing you on as a collaborator, you're kind of like the doctor. Like you're not yeah. giving mm -hmm. someone your liver, mm -hmm. but you are like snapping their spine into place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like you're using your skills mm -hmm. to help that person, but you're not giving them a part of you. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a really good yeah. metaphor. Yeah. Like All right, I have, I have done my uh, good input for this hour. All right, carry on. All right, <laughs> yeah. <Creative. laughs> Be a creative chiropractor. Uh -huh. Yep, just yeah. snap their spine into place. Finish it. <laughs> Fatality. Fatality. <laughs> 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 well, that that may be all we have. I don't know. Any other oh, no. uh, famous Final last thing? How about, how about how Ryan? How, how are you feeling about it? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, Ryan. He, yeah. he chose to collaborate with all of us. <laughs> yes. uh, one day we need to get one of those monitors where you can give us notes. Yeah, oh no, yeah. that's a terrible idea. What if mm -hmm. they just took it over while during a broadcast and you just see them like uh -huh. with gibberish? Yeah. What? You mean the black insert screen that we occasionally put over while our guests are still talking to sort of correct them in real time? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think uh, like, just a rumor. Actually, thinking about how we all came here together, making a collaborative panel about collaboration. Mm -hmm. One of those things is the, the idea of the person who put us here having mm -hmm. trust that we could collaborate. And yeah. I think the overall meaning of this entire panel, I think, has been trusting mm -hmm. people with your work and their work and, mm -hmm. and how do you find people you trust and build people you trust. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really beautiful thing. Yeah. So. And I think Ryan uh, was originally going to be on this panel. And mm -hmm. in the spirit yeah. of collaboration, mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that everybody who was here today got to be on a panel and he mm -hmm. stepped away. And that's yeah. why mm -hmm. we're, we had to do it together. And in exactly. the spirit of Angelique's uh, metaphor about doctors, uh, Ryan, thanks for uh, giving us your liver to yeah. operate on. <laughs> We hope we didn't ruin it horribly. <laughs> and that's all for us. Yeah, no, that seems like a good place to stop. Uh, yeah. Let Well, I mean, we have to plug your things and once ah. again sort of say things. Like, for instance, hey, I've been Eric Whalen. Um, you can find me on social media at Game Lawyer Whalen most places. Hello, I'm Sam Sterling. Uh, you can find me wherever your favorite internet place is, at Hey Sam Sterling. If I'm not there, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, just keep up with you know whatever I'm doing. I just do a lot of random weird things. So, I'm Angelique Rockwood. Uh, you can find me on most social medias under Angelic Rockwood. That's not just because I'm super egotistical. It, Angelique Rockwood does not fit, so I shortened it to Angelic. So but for a plug, can you hand me that book? What? What on the fuck? That one. Oh no. Oh no. You defeated uh, a heartless. It, this is not mine, but it is something that I helped collaborate on a little bit, especially uh, just with the structure of it. But this is Changeling. This is a book by Kiri Cal Kalian, and this is, you know, my wife. But Your wife. My wife. But yes, <laughs> this is a great book. And speaking of, speaking of mm -hmm. I, I am a pentameter, um, her Queen of Hearts speaks in I am a uh, pentameter. Love yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Right? So yeah. mm -hmm. Changeling by Kiri Kalian. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Check it out. And you can get it? Yeah. Where? Where can you get oh, it? Oh, you can get it uh, where books are sold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, I don't have a ton to promote right now, but I'm Emmett Fury on all of the socials. I assume the spelling is hereabouts. Yeah. Just about there. <laughs> yeah. <but> <laughs> <laughs> here, we can pass it across the table and <laughs> add to, <laughs> to Ryan's uh, work. <laughs> so here, yeah, you can, you can hold it and we just sort of... Pick it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Would you like to <laughs> hand it to me? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and we just sort of pass it along, and we'll just whoop out the window. And no, 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 no,